This morning, the Old Testament scripture reading comes from the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Jesus, out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more they were called, the more they went away from me. They sacrificed into the Baas, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms, but they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. To them I was like one who lifts a little child to the cheek, and I bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt and not to Assyria, rule over them because they refuse to repent? A sword will flash in their cities. It will devour their false prophets and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me, even though they call me God Most High. I will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over to Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like a Zebo- Zeboim? My heart is changed within me, and my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I devastate Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One among you. I will not come against their cities. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion, and when he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come from Egypt, trembling like sparrows from Assyria, fluttering like doves, and I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. The New Testament reading comes from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or by arbitrator between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a, rich, of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, What should I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be, and whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. The word of the Lord. We've been going through the Gospel of Luke, and Luke talks a lot about money. Well, to be more specific, Jesus talks a lot about money in the Gospel of Luke. You see, each of the Gospels talk about the story of Jesus' life, from his early days, through his baptism, through his ministry, and ultimately his death and crucifixion on the cross. But Luke particularly talks a lot about Jesus' relationship with money. How do we deal with our stuff? How do we deal with our own self-value? Where do we get our sense of identity and worth in this world that says to us all the time, you have to have whiter whites and brighter colors for your laundry, and you have to have this new appliance that lets you knock two times to see what's inside your fridge. You have to have this faster car with better mileage. You have to have fancier clothes. It seems like our world is built on consumption. We need to consume. We need to amass for ourselves. We need to have enough. And I'll, con- I'll confess that in my own life, I have this weird sense of s- there's always not going to be enough. So whenever it comes to like using things up, I'll, I'll, when I write notes on paper, sometimes I tend to write real small because, get this, I'm afraid I might run out of paper and have to use more. Since I don't want to run out, I'll write real small. 
when I use up a tube of toothpaste, like I'll get out there with like the dowel and like sit there and like roll it up to make sure I get every last little bit and squeeze it. I've even poked holes in the back to be able to scrape it out of the back. <laughs> because for me, it's like, well, if there's still something in there, I don't, I don't want to waste it. Because what if, what if I'm not able to buy more toothpaste at the store tomorrow? What if everything, what if they're at the end of the world and this is the last little bit of toothpaste I have? We have this sense in our minds that what we have are things, our stuff, are what make us who we are, are what keep us going each day, that give us value to life. So when the person comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me, as our passage this morning began. Jesus is walking, teaching, preaching, and you get a sense that the person who's asking it's probably a younger brother. Because if you're the older brother, you get all the inheritance. You get the lion's share. So the younger brother probably comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, Jesus, tell my older brother to split the inheritance with me. I don't have enough. I don't think he's being fair. I think I need more. So Jesus says to this person, watch out. Watch out. A common day phrase might be, listen up. Pay attention. Then Jesus says, be on the lookout for all types of greed. All types of greed. Now, normally when we think of greed, we think of like Ebenezer Scrooge, like sitting in his counting house, like counting out his pennies. And And we think, oh, he's greedy. That's wrong. That's a sin. I'm not like that. I'm not greedy. I'm generous. But when it comes to how I define myself, I have to make sure I have my stuff set up here and here and here and here. And heaven forbid, I don't have something. Oh my goodness, I don't have my my extra thing here. I need more. I don't have enough. Jesus says there are different types of greed. And to be aware of all types of them. So then Jesus probably looks at the perplexed look on the young man's face who just came to ask about splitting the inheritance. And Jesus says, be, be aware of all different types of greed. And this young guy's probably like, I just asked for my inheritance from my brother. What do you mean, be aware of different types of greed? So Jesus tells them this parable. Jesus loves telling parables. There are little stories that he makes up. And in the stories that he tells, he gives little tiny details that hopefully people can pick up on, and then some very big details he gives. So for this story that we heard today, he tells a story about a certain rich man. Doesn't name a name, doesn't name a location, but just says this man had an abundant harvest. So you can imagine he's growing his fields and he's looking out being like, oh my goodness, that's really coming up full. The birds aren't eating it. The drought hasn't come. The water's been plentiful. I've got this huge harvest. What am I going to do? I know. I'll tear down my barns because they're too small and I'll build up bigger barns. And then I'll store all of my grain and I'll say to myself, self, you've done well. Eat, drink, and be merry. And then Jesus says, on that very night, God came to that certain rich person and said, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. And what will become of your abundant harvest and your barns and all of your things? In the story Jesus tells, this rich person has no heirs. There's no family. There's no friends. There's no story about any other sense of value in this person's life. Most of us, when we ask what's most important to you, would probably say, my family, my friends. Maybe some of us might say our job. Some of us might say the most important thing to my life is, you know, my vehicle, my car, I had a friend back when I just graduated college and I asked him, I was like, what's the most important thing in your life? What's the one thing you couldn't live without? And he kind of thought for a while and he's probably, you know, probably my computer because that's where I do all my business and my communication with everybody. And, you know, this was, you know, a decade or so ago. So this was before smartphones. And I'm sure now he'd probably say, oh, my iPhone. You know, that's where I do all my business. That's where I keep all my contacts. That's where I do all my things. And if I were to lose that thing, I would be less. I would be lost. I would be worthless. I wouldn't be able to do anything. 
Life might as well be over if I didn't have my stuff. So that's when Jesus comes and tells the story about this man who says, my life would be nothing if it's not for my stuff. In the Greek, the word he says when he says, I will say to myself, he actually says, I will tell my soul, my psyche, I will tell my soul, soul, live well. You see, when we think we tell our souls to live well, when we have to tell ourselves things, it often means that we don't already believe them. How many of you remember the old SNL skit of, of Stuart Smalley where he'd look in the mirror, it was Al Franken, and he'd say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. And that kind of became a gag, right? Where people, you know, you know you don't feel great about yourself when you have to look at yourself in the mirror and tell yourself, you know what, people like you, you're going to do great today. But the reality is, is that most of us, deep down, have a sense of insecurity over something that we do, some way that we look, some way that we act, something that we have, and we wonder, how can I make up for it? This man who had this abundant crops obviously felt that there was something lacking in his heart because it's not until he sees this abundant harvest when he says, okay, now that I have this, now I can say to myself, Soul, now you will be satisfied. And in the Greek, again, he even uses the future tense. So now that I have all this grain, I will be satisfied. He's not even satisfied in the moment. Same thing for us. We'll find ourselves at a moment in time, faced with a decision, and we'll think to ourselves, oh man, if only I had this. If only I felt like this. If only I was just a little more like this. Then I could be happy. Then I could get what I want. And the reality Jesus points out in this story is that it doesn't matter how much stuff you get, where you find yourself. Because it's not the stuff that defines us. It's not even the relationships that we have around us that define us. It's not how many times we come to church or how much we give to charities Jesus says, you need to be rich towards God. Now, what does that mean? In this last verse, Jesus says, so shall it be with everyone who is not rich towards God. What does it mean for us to be rich towards God? It means to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, God created me the way I am. God created me as a beloved child of God. Jesus Christ went to death. He was mocked in the, the halls of justice with Pontius Pilate and the soldiers and everyone making fun of Jesus. He could have said, please, let me go. He could have struck them all with lightning. He could have done all sorts of a number of things. But Jesus just sat there and took it. He let the world heap scorn upon him and physical abuse and emotional abuse. And Jesus says, I am not defined by your punishment. I am defined by the love of God, my Father. And in doing so, he showed the people that what being rich towards God meant. It meant knowing that God is with me in my heart. That's right. Little babies blowing raspberries. Blowing raspberries at the world, because it doesn't matter what your neighbor says or what your boss says about you or even what your parents or what your kids think. It's about what God thinks. And yeah, we may have made mistakes. Yeah, we may not be the most perfect person in the world, but God looks at us and says, you're still my child. And if you want to be rich in God, follow my ways. If you want to say to your soul, I am content, I am at peace, and not worried about constantly amassing things and growing things, then you can turn to Jesus. And he can give you the peace that he carried each and every day. You see, Christ walked through the world without a home. He didn't have a job. Everywhere he went, people were spreading rumors about him, talking slander about him. He had no money. But yet in all of those things, he was content. He knew God was with him. So for us to cultivate a life rich towards God, I pray that we would turn our hearts to Him. 
You can read in the scriptures, you can read in the story of Luke what it means to be rich towards God, and that might mean changing some of our behaviors. It might mean turning away from values that we currently have. But to be rich towards God means one thing, to be rich in the love that he has given us, to be rich in the love of forgiveness, of mercy, of compassion, to be rich in grace and forgiveness. It's these things that make us rich towards God. All things might come and fade away, but God's word remains forever. God's love remains forever. So I would encourage you this day and every day to remember you are rich towards God. You are worthy because Jesus Christ laid down his life for you. And in so doing, he bought your life and said, you don't have to worry for I have taken your life for myself. All you have to do is accept it. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we give you thanks for your message to your disciples, to the people. Lord, we pray that we might be rich towards God. Help us, Lord, to challenge the values in our life. Help us to know that you are always with us and that you, Lord, have told us that we are valuable, we are loved, no matter what other people say. So Lord, we give you thanks in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.